what makes us tick? How do our minds work? For centuries, these questions were largely left to philosophers and theologians. Then, around a hundred years ago, a new science began to open a window on the inner workings of the mind. It was called experimental psychology. In this series, I will explore the history of how this new science revealed things about human nature that were surprising and often profoundly shocking. The experiment requires that we continue. But he might be dead in there. Ever since I was a medical student, I've been fascinated by psychology, by its brutal history, and by how far some researchers have been prepared to go in the search for answers. This time, I'm investigating how studying the abnormal brain has shone a bright light onto the workings of the normal brain. It got totally out of control. He's smacking me and hitting me and pulling my hair out. When the brain is damaged by natural causes or by operations that go wrong, the bizarre symptoms that sometimes then result have often been extremely illuminating. Can you tell me what the number was? Five. What we've learnt from experiments done on these unique, unfortunate individuals has implications for us all. They've taught us astonishing things, not just how the brain works, but its hidden potential. I'm actually using it pretty much like I would use vision. Excellent. Angela, a 45-year-old mother, has been having epileptic fits. Part of her temporal lobe is damaged, creating flurries of electrical impulses that spread across her brain, causing frequent, uncontrollable seizures. Drugs haven't worked, so she's opted for a far more radical treatment. We're going to take out roughly a line like a line like that. Right. Her surgeon, Paul Eldridge, is about to remove part of her brain. The damaged area lies deep inside the brain, beneath the temporal lobe. Paul has to open her skull and then carefully navigate through critical regions of her brain to reach the affected area. It is an extremely delicate procedure. If it works, it should end Angela's fits, but there are significant risks. The knowledge that makes an operation like this possible has been hard won. Success relies on an incredibly detailed understanding of what different parts of the brain do. We all know that thoughts, ideas, beliefs, the things that make us human, are somehow generated within this lump of grey porridge up here in our heads. But until relatively recently, that wasn't fully understood. And in fact, up to about 150 years ago, we knew very little about what the human brain actually did. So, how did doctors begin to put it all together? How did they first start to map the brain? to see a brain, a very special brain, because it kick-started the whole of modern neuroscience and it also utterly transformed our understanding of how our own brains work. The 
brain I'm looking for should be in this room here. <laughs> wow. Anatomists in the 19th century made great strides in understanding how the key organs in the body function. And through studying deformed and diseased specimens, such as these at the Dupatron Museum, they were able to learn how our organs develop. But by far the hardest organ to study was the brain. Unlike other organs, you cannot guess which bits of the brain do what simply by looking at them. Then, in 1861, the surgeon was called to the bedside of a dying man. His name was Le Bon, and we know relatively little about him. Legend has it that as a young man he contracted syphilis, rather like this unfortunate over here. And as a result of that, he lost the power of speech, apart from the ability to say one word, Tom. Le Bon had gangrene in his right leg, and local surgeon Paul Brocker was asked to examine him. Brocker became intrigued by Le Bon's unusual speech impediment. His voice box was undamaged, and he clearly understood questions. So why could he only say Paul? Brocker could do nothing for Le Bon. The gangrene spread, and he died two days later. Now, the important thing is Brocker realised he had a unique opportunity here, and he seized it with both hands. He got out his saw, he cut open the Bourne's head, and he extracted his brain. This brain. This is the brain that Brocker removed. It's in pretty manky condition, but then again it is 150 years old. And it is fairly obvious when you look at it where the damage lies. It's this region over here. And what Brocker was able to do was he was able to put two and two together. Le Bourne had obviously suffered from a severe problem with his speech. He could only say, ton, ton. There's a big chunk of his brain missing here. Well, that suggested to Brocker that this area here must be responsible for speech. When news of his discovery got out, Brocker became extremely famous. He modestly lent his own name to the region he'd uncovered. It's known as Brocker's area. Whatever it was that caused Le Bourne's unfortunate brain damage, his life and then death helped Paul Brocker establish a really important principle. The different parts of the brain have different skills. They do different things. It's something called localization. Localization is at the heart of our understanding of how the brain works. Today, scientists are still trying to work out in ever finer detail exactly what different parts of the brain do. And it is still patients with damaged brains who offer the greatest insights. One area that continues to fascinate is the area that Paul Brocker himself studied, language. Julius Sidira is fluent in German, Spanish and English. She used to work as a management consultant. I used to be on the phone all the time. I used to talk, 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 talk. But then, three years ago, she had a massive stroke. I couldn't talk at all. I could say absolutely nothing. I remember when I had to say something, I couldn't even say my um, my husband's man, name, his name. I couldn't even say his name. The only thing I knew was Sophia. She appears to have made a good recovery. But when her speech is tested at University College London, a very different picture emerges. So you're going to look at the picture okay. and tell me what it is. Pipe, 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 pipe
Parry. Pay. Pa no. Can you tell me anything about it? It's hot. It's very good. In Brazil, loads of people eat that a lot. Julia is unable to name things. Um, I should go buy them. They're called le le Lebret. What do you do with it? Put it in there. The paper. Envel. Again? Envelope. Elephone. Envelope. For neurologist Kathy Price, rare cases like Julia are an invaluable opportunity to learn more about the intricacies of speech. It's very clear when you're speaking to her that she understands um, what is happening. She understands what she's looking at. Brum, brum, to brum, come on. She's also able to generate a lot of speech that sounds very fluent. The problem that she has is linking up, finding exactly the right words to describe the meanings that she's thinking of. Are you talking about Egypt? Yes, that one. Yes. Tell me how you feel when you're 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 doing this. I just I have no idea how to say it. I I can't even think about it. I know exactly what it is. But there is no other day what I can say. I don't know what I should say. I just can't say it. Unlike Broca, who could only study his patients after they died, Kathy can look at Julia's brain while it's processing language to see what's gone wrong. Looking at Julia's scan, the first surprise is her Broca's area is completely intact. The damage is further back in her brain. This is a picture of um, the structure of Julia's brain. We can see the dark area here in the parietal cortex where the stroke has caused quite a lot of damage. This is one of many areas of the brain which are now known to be involved in creating speech. The scan also shows Kathy which areas light up when Julia tries to speak, which she can then compare to a healthy brain. The red signal shows that the undamaged Broca's area is active. The adjacent blue area is where the damage lies. What you can see here in the blue area is that she's got less activation than normal. And this fits in with her symptoms insofar as this area here is important for, for translating visual information into speech. It's because this blue area is damaged that Julia can't say pineapple, even though she knows what it is. But there's one other fascinating finding. What's interesting is that in this yellow area here in the anterior part of the temporal lobe, and this is an area of the brain that's associated with meaning, this area is more activated um, in Julia, which suggests that she's relying more on the meaning of the word to work out how to say it. Julia is one of hundreds of stroke victims who are contributing to Kathy's ambitious project to produce a detailed map of brain areas we use for language. We now know that there are many, many regions of the brain that are involved in language. We could probably label half the brain um, involved in language. And the new research is trying to break those areas down into smaller and smaller components where we understand how different areas of the brain respond in a much more precise way. I think it's very good. This emerging picture of language ability spread right across the brain helps explain Julia's partial recovery. Although she's lost a big chunk of brain, Julia is still able to communicate by using some of the remaining undamaged language areas. Okay, I can't say this, I can't say that, but I can say, can you help me pierce that way or that way? I, I'm playing around what I have to say, and I'm so much more myself again, you know? And I think, okay, I can't say all these things. So what? I can help with that. I, I, I you know, I can do what I think I need. Taking off the chocolate. 
It's now into Angela's operation, and Paul is now working deep inside her brain. He's carefully cutting his way through an area called the anterior temporal lobe. He's about a centimeter from the scarred area that's triggering her epilepsy. Temporal lobe down here, so that's the way the skin is coming out. He's managed to pick his way through Angela's brain without doing her serious harm, thanks to maps. Maps based on years of painstaking experimentation. It means Paul knows which areas are safe to pass through. What should that bit of brain be doing? Not much is the answer, so if you take it out, not much seems to happen. It's kind of hard to believe there are bits of brain that don't do anything. They used to be known as the silent areas. Right. Now Paul really has an excellent idea of where he is. He's got all this technology around him. But in the early days of neuroscience, they really had very imprecise maps. And as a result, mistakes were made and terrible tragedies occurred. But it was actually from some of those tragedies that the greatest lessons were learned. Perhaps the most notorious example of a surgical intervention that went horribly wrong occurred in 1953. For a long time, the patient, Henry Meliasson, was one of psychology's most valued and closely guarded secrets. Known only by his initials, H.M. Do you know what you did yesterday? No, I don't. How about this morning? I don't even remember that. Can you tell me what day of the week it is? No, I can't. An accident when he was young triggered a chain of events that robbed Henry of a normal life, but helped science unravel one of the great mysteries of the mind, how our memories work. When he was seven years old, Henry was playing in the street. Something caught his eye and he ran out onto the road. He was knocked to the ground by a passing bicycle. A trivial sounding accident, the sort that happens all the time. Young Henry needed a number of stitches in his head but seemed otherwise okay. Yet this apparently trivial incident would shape his entire life and would eventually lead to his becoming the most studied person in the whole history of psychology. At first, things carried on normally. Henry played with friends, went on trips with his father. But increasingly, he found himself having vacant periods he couldn't account for. On his 16th birthday, Henry got into his parents' car and prepared to head off to town to celebrate. As they crossed the bridge into Hartford, Henry's entire body seized up, his limbs and head jerking violently. The childhood head injury had left a terrible legacy, epilepsy. From then on, Henry's life was dominated by his illness. In the 1940s, attitudes were less enlightened. His father turned his back on him, saying it was shameful to have a mental in the family. By the time he was 27, he was having massive seizures on a weekly basis. Something had to be done. He was referred to a local surgeon, William Scoville, whose chief specialities were ruptured discs and lobotomies. 
A colleague of Scoville's described him as a free spirit, unfettered by rules or regulations, probably not the sort of man you'd want operating on your son. Scoville thought an area of the brain called the hippocampus might be causing Henry's epilepsy. Little was known about this region and surgeons hadn't dared penetrate that deeply into the brain. So, on no more than a hunch, Scoville decided to remove Henry's hippocampus and see what happened. With Henry anaesthetized but fully awake, Scoville drilled into his skull, then pulled out his favorite operating tool. He inserted a silver straw deep into Henry's brain and then started to suck. Since Henry was awake throughout, he wondered what he made of it. By the time Scoville paused for breath, he had sucked out the entire structure known as the hippocampus and some of the cells around it. Not surprisingly, Henry emerged from the operation a changed man. He still had his personality and his IQ, but he could no longer form new memories. It was like he was lost in a deep fog. He could remember his childhood and up to the operation, but nothing after that. Well, I possibly had an operation or something. Uh-huh. Tell me about that. I don't remember it. Do you remember your doctor's name? No, I don't. Does the name Dr. Scoble sound familiar? Yes, that does. Tell me about Dr. Scoble. Well, he did medical research on people. At first, Dr. Scoville seemed remarkably unconcerned by his error. Apparently, he went home to his wife and said, Guess what? I tried to cut the epilepsy out of a patient and instead took his memory. What a trade. He eventually admitted that the surgery had been frankly experimental and urged other surgeons not to repeat his dreadful mistake. One thing Scoville did get right was he kept meticulous notes of exactly what he had removed. His clean surgical strike meant he had created the perfect amnesiac. Henry's surgically altered brain was a potential goldmine for psychologists keen to understand exactly how it is we build memories. For the next 50 years, Henry was visited almost daily by a stream of eager researchers keen to try out their ideas. One of the last academics to come here to Henry's care home and investigate his brain was Professor Elizabeth Kensinger from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Do you think you mind in talk people coming in and probing around inside his head or asking him questions all the time? Right, of course, he, he would have no idea that people had come with him to this frequency. But it seemed like most of the time we would have a fairly natural banter and he would know what was going on. But if there was a knock at the door and I had to turn and talk to the person that had just come in, and then I looked back at Henry, often it would become clear to me that he no longer had any idea of what we've been talking about before. Why was there so much interest in Henry? we suddenly understood that there was a particular part of the brain, the hippocampus and the tissue surrounding the hippocampus, that was really fundamentally important and that if you didn't have that tissue, you weren't going to be able to record new memories that you would have conscious access to. Now they knew that the hippocampus was crucial for creating memories from the events of our lives, researchers could begin to explore the details of how it did this. Memories require a, a really diffuse association between a lot of different areas. So if you think about your conscious memory of 
having breakfast this morning. It's going to involve the sight of the food, the smell of the food, the taste of the food. It's going to involve all of these different elements. But you need some part of the brain that can actually bind together those different elements and have it be a representation that comes back to you and that feels complete. It's astonishing just how much research was generated from this one man. You generated lots of research. Yes, 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 absolutely. There have been actually over a hundred scientists that have worked with him and more than 10,000 articles that have cited studies that have been done with him. So basically everything that we know about memory really began with, with the study of Henry. Down the years, every aspect of Henry's mind was examined, from the content of his dreams to his memory for pain. Okay, so if you want to come on in here, this is... But a simple experiment involving nothing more complicated than a mirror was perhaps the most surprising and revealing of them all. So what I'd like for you to do in this task is to just look at the reflection in the mirror and use that to try to trace along the outline of the star that you see there in the mirror. Okay, it's a very simple task. That's okay. I'm going away, therefore I'm coming towards... <laughs> the opposite doesn't... The opposite takes me off in that direction, so I need to do the inverse opposite. No, I just think, okay, it just goes that way. <laughs> but you don't go that way. No, not that way. God, blimey. There we go. <laughs> All right. How long did that take? Not very impressive, I don't <laughs> so, so this is pretty typical of a, of a first trial, actually. Now, when Henry was given the mirror test to do over a series of days, he quickly became very good at it despite insisting each time that he had never done the test before. This revealed that Henry's surgery had removed his ability to form new conscious memories or episodic memories, but it hadn't disrupted his ability to show learning on these types of motor tasks. Since he had no hippocampus, remembering physical skills must be processed in a different part of the brain. And this was big, was it? This was huge. Before this time, we didn't really understand that there were these different forms of memory. Henry had unwittingly contributed to a major discovery, that there are two types of memory. One allows us to unconsciously remember physical skills, like riding a bike. The other, to consciously recall the moments of our life. Henry died in 2008, at the grand old age of 82. Many people came to his funeral, mostly academics. He had transformed our understanding of memory, but he had no idea of the part he'd played. How long have you had uh, trouble remembering things? That I don't know myself. I can't tell you because I don't remember. What do you think you'll do tomorrow? Whatever is beneficial. Good answer. The story of Henry's brain didn't end with his death. His brain was considered so important to neuroscience it was removed within hours of his death and taken on a long journey. Henry's brain ended up here, in San Diego, at a specially built facility, thousands of miles away from where he had lived and died. This multi-million pound brain observatory was set up specially so scientists could continue to learn from Henry. Henry's became the first brain to undergo an experimental procedure devised by Professor Jacopo Anese. It's been shaved forensically into 2,401 micro-thin segments and put through a chemical process to preserve every detail. Brain observatory, right place. Hello. Hello, hi there. 
Hi, I'm Leslie. I'm David of Jacobo. Hello, what a fantastic office. Thank you. I come see Henry's Brandon. Okay, he's the only Brandon I keep in my office. Okay. So we're going to show you some slides. To Jacopo, these slides are not just research, they are the essence of Henry. It's not just a specimen, it's actually a person. Yes, he had life. And in fact, you know, even calling them by name, you know, knowing who they were, uh, it just, everybody here just feels very more reverent. We're continuing the biography of HM based on these images. Yes. The new technique involves taking very high resolution images of each slice of brain, which can then be examined in all dimensions. It's brain mapping on a micro level the most precise ever attempted. The goal was to be able to navigate everywhere in the brain, yeah. to look at single neurons. Now, this is the resolution that we need to understand exactly what structures were affected by the lesion. Okay. This new data can be cross-referenced to the mass of psychological research collected on Henry over the years. The aim is to build a complete picture of how the memory works right down to the level of the neuron. This is massively detailed. Isn't it? Well, this is massive amount of data too. But you see, you can recognize individual cells. So we're zooming in now. You can resolve individual neurons in the cortex right. and individual fibers. So again, you can, you can go in the in little alleyways, not just the, the big freeways. Yes. The Brain Observatory is expanding, opening its doors to other extraordinary individuals who have been studied in life and will now be studied in death. They have a hugely ambitious goal to find physical traces in the brain of all our memories. Do you think ultimately we'll be able to make more sense of this? We're trying to find out if there is indeed like clues left behind, like if this conversation, is there going to be a, something in these images in our brains that it's a testimony of, of what happened? Yes. That, that's the, what, what is fascinating. Do you think we're getting closer to that? Because it seems to me that what you're doing is you're getting to ever greater levels of complexity. Yes, but we don't know still what's relevant. That's the big question mark. That's yeah. what we're trying to catalog and to make a registry that will catalog every little detail in the brain. Jacopo is carefully preserving unusual brains in the hope that scholars in the future will be able to study them using technologies we cannot yet imagine. The Latins used to say, verba volant scripta manent, you know, what's in writing stays. So this is what was written in the brain and you cannot change that. So a story which begins with a boy being hit by a bicycle nearly 80 years ago ends with his brain being preserved within this building in the form of, well, thousands of slices, but also terabytes of data. It is a form of immortality that I'm sure Henry himself would never have dreamt of. It's now an hour and a half into Angela's epilepsy operation, and Paul has succeeded in exposing the scarred area within her temporal lobe that he wants to remove. And so this is the source of her epilepsy. Yeah. So the source of her epilepsy is in this bit here. Right. So when you remove that, what's the chance that that will actually cure her epilepsy? The stated figures are around a 70% seizure-free rate. Angela is fortunate. Paul has identified the focus of her seizures. When that isn't possible, a more drastic form of surgery, pioneered more than 60 years ago, may be called for. Back in the 1940s, surgeons decided to try a completely radical new approach. Instead of, as with Angela, cutting out a small section of the brain, they decided it would be a good idea to cut the corpus callosum, the highway that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. 
the effect of doing this was utterly unexpected. Put your left hand through the screen. I'm going to put a number in your hand now. He observes what happens with a housewife cannot see her hands. Can you tell me what that number was? Four? The corpus callosum is a band of 55 million nerve fibers which connect the two halves of the brain and keep them in constant contact. Okay, Dave, I'm going to start to divide the corpus callosum. In the new operation, surgeons slice through this superhighway, disconnecting the two halves of the brain. This halted the flurries of electrical activity that cause seizures. After they had recovered from their operation, they appeared to be normal. Which was amazing, given the extent to which the whole architecture of their brains had been altered. This 12-year-old boy is doing some pretty impressive subdivision. And his spelling isn't bad either. But in psychology circles, they became legends. And that is because these patients would, in time, reveal something that to me is truly astonishing. The two halves of our brain each contain a sort of separate consciousness. Each hemisphere is capable of its own independent action. This sensational finding came about by accident. A group of scientists in California recognized the experimental potential of the split-brain patients. Because their brains had been separated, it was a unique opportunity to find out if the different hemispheres had different abilities, and if so, what. To do this, they had to devise ingenious experiments that would test each hemisphere in isolation. Neurobiologist Roger Sperry set to work. The results were bizarre for the patients and for the researchers. I remember seeing this footage nearly 30 years ago and being completely blown away. Sperry's experiments made use of the fact that the right hand is controlled by the left hemisphere and vice versa. Put your left hand through the screen. Clean. I'm going to put a number in your hand now. And what I want you to do is signal the answer. So here's the first number. So far, no great surprises. But then the researcher asks her to name out loud the number that she's got in her hand. Can you tell me what that number was? Four? Okay. Now let me give you another number. She gestures eight, which is the correct answer. Can you tell me again what the number was? Six? But she says six, which is of course completely wrong. So what's going on? What was happening is the numbers were put in her left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere. But the right hemisphere can't speak, so the left hand communicated with researchers by waving fingers up like that. The left hemisphere, in the meanwhile, is completely in the dark. It cannot see or feel what the left hand is doing, so it just wildly guesses. Five. This was the first experimental proof of what people had previously suspected, that language resides solely in the left hemisphere. Sperry now decided to find out just what the right hemisphere could do. So what's happening here is the left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, is being given a puzzle to solve. The puzzle required rearranging blocks so they matched the pattern on a picture. And it's actually pretty good. It gets the puzzle solved pretty damn fast. So now it's the turn of the other hemisphere. And I have 
have to say it's making a real pig's ear of it. Clearly, the left hemisphere hasn't got a clue how to solve this puzzle. The other hand decides to come in and help. No, never going to get there. This is pretty convincing evidence that although the left hemisphere may have language, the right hemisphere has spatial skills. This discovery that the right side is responsible for spatial awareness was followed up by other discoveries, such as the fact that the right side can recognize faces. But more than that, Sperry was convinced that as he put it, each hemisphere is a conscious system in its own right, perceiving, thinking, remembering, reasoning, willing, and emoting. In 1981, Sperry received a Nobel Prize for his work, but in a cruel twist of fate, by then he was suffering from a fatal degenerative brain disease called Kuru, probably picked up in the early days of his research while splitting brains. brain experiments had revealed the individual characteristics of each hemisphere. The next question was, how did the two differing halves interact with each other? Most people who have had their corpus callosum cut, who have had the split brain operation, are perfectly normal afterwards. You could cross them in the street and you wouldn't know anything had happened. But there are some cases in which the end results are particularly dramatic. What's going on? Tell us what's going on. From childhood, Karen Byrne suffered from daily epileptic seizures. She decided that having her brain surgically split was her best chance of a normal life. Hello, Karen. Hi, how are you? Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Ooh. Hi. I did have a little trepidation as far as what kind of condition I was going to be in after the surgery. I woke up and I'm telling you, I was not the same girl I was 48 hours before that day, that's for sure. I was not the same person. And I never would be again. Surgery resolved the epilepsy, but created an entirely new problem. Dr. O'Connor said, Karen, what are you doing? And I just looked at him and I said, I, what are you talking about? He said, your hand's undressing you. And I had no idea. My hand was opening up the buttons. Right. And so I'm re-buttoning them with the right hand and the left hand's unbuttoning them. And he called in put an emergency call through to Dr. Sperling and said, you, Mike, you got to get here right away. you got to get here. we got a problem. Can you lift your hands up in the air? How about the other hand? Can you lift your left hand in the air? Um, can you give me a thumbs up with this hand? Give me a thumbs up. Okay. Show me the Karen emerged from the operation with a left hand that had a mind of its own. What's going on? Tell us what's going on. An extremely rare condition known as alien hand syndrome. Now this is it. This is when I, that's what happens. See it smacks you and it hits you. You look almost possessed there. Right? Yep, yep, yep. Basically that's what, that's how you do it. Yeah, it's so, it's terrible. You find it disturbing? I mean, I find it disturbing. For myself, for myself no, but for other people around me I do because I think it's very frightening for them. It's unbelievably strange. That's what happens. And it smacks you so badly. My whole face is so swollen, so swollen, so black and blue. She was eventually discharged from hospital, but she had to live with a wayward, willful hand. This hand would do one thing, and this hand would do the opposite. So you're trying, yes. to, you're trying to have a cigarette? Put a cigarette, and this hand would put it up. Right. The phone would ring, and I would answer the phone, and the left hand would 
you hit the clipper, the thing on the phone will tell you to hang up the phone. It really is just like an annoying five-year-old, isn't it? Or definitely. an annoying three-year-old. Just and definitely, doesn't... definitely. And it, it got so frustrating. And, it, and then you couldn't get mad at it because it was you. Karen's alien hand syndrome was caused by a power struggle going on in her brain. Our brains normally function smoothly because the analytical left hemisphere dominates, having the final say in what actions we perform. And this was certainly true of the bulk of the split brain patients. Karen was extremely unlucky. After the operation, the right side of her brain refused to be dominated by the left leaving her hands in near constant conflict. It's very strange, isn't it, this thought that all of us within us have these two hemispheres um, and the, they are wrestling to some extent for dominance. Yes, yes. And yes. that normally the left is in control. But in your case, after the split brain, for whatever reasons, the right became... Oh, definitely. It's so powerful. dominant. Oh, my gosh. And, and it really kind of, for for a short period of time, really frightened me. It really yeah. did because I just didn't understand why it was fighting so hard to have such power mm. over the other side. Finally her doctors found a medication that restrained her impulsive right hemisphere, bringing her alien hand back under her conscious control. If you really think about it, a lot of it is just horrific, and yet, you know, yes. yet it's also tremendously it's funny. funny. It's funny, <laughs> you got it. How yes. could you not think it's funny? On the whole, psychiatrists are not encouraged to laugh at the patients of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate everything. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Okay. Maybe I should shake both hands. Yes, I think you should. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Life with two warring hemispheres would be impossible. In fact, scientists now believe it was the evolution of a left hemisphere that was dominant, with its quintessentially human attributes of logic and language that helped us become what we are today. It's now a couple of hours into Angela's surgery. Paul is about to remove the scarred area of her temporal lobe that has been triggering her seizures. This is the temporal lobe, and we've just detached the lateral part of it so that we can see the medial part of it, that's the inside part, which is where we think the pathology lies, so this is Ooh, right. giving us access to it, and there it is. That is quite a big chunk of brain, isn't it? Paul's now removed the damaged area and he's hopeful that she will now make a full recovery. The success of an operation like this, the fact that a surgeon can take out a big chunk of brain without damaging the patient, is dramatic proof of just how far we have come in understanding the anatomy of the brain. Angela. Your eyes for me. Hopefully, Angela will now be given a new lease of life. Um. But there was one final discovery that sprang from the study of damaged brains. It turns out that the map of brain function is not as rigid as scientists had always believed. And that has some astonishing implications. This new way of thinking was triggered by a personal tragedy. One that would change our understanding of just what the brain is capable of. In 1960, a poet called Pedro Bacchirita had a massive paralyzing stroke. 
At the time, it was widely believed that once brain tissue is dead, there is no real scope for recovery. The family were told there was nothing more that could be done. Pedro's elder son, George, decided to ignore the doctor's advice. He took his father home and began a series of exercises to see how far he could push his recovery. Pedro couldn't talk or walk, so George made him crawl. The neighbours were absolutely horrified at the idea that the son was making this elderly man crawl like a dog. But he started to recover, and then George made him do tasks all around the house, like washing up, and when he broke the plates, he simply replaced them with metal ones. He kept at it for three long years, by the end of which Pedro had made an almost miraculous recovery. He went back to work, he got remarried, and when he eventually died, it was not from a stroke, but from a heart attack, following a climb up a mountain. By that time, Pedro's younger son, Paul, was a neurologist. Because his father had made such a good recovery, he naturally assumed the stroke must have affected a small area of his brain. Paul took the unusual decision to go to his father's autopsy. What he saw was a complete surprise. Paul was absolutely stunned. There were huge areas of damage in his father's brain. 97% of the nerves connecting the cortex to the spinal cord had been destroyed. So how had Pedro managed to learn to walk again? Paul decided that somehow his father's brain must have learnt to reorganise itself, replacing the work of the dead tissue with other sections of living brain. Pedro's example showed that with the right support, stroke victims can sometimes make amazing recoveries. It helped transform how stroke victims are treated. Paul decided to dedicate his life to trying to understand what had happened to his father's brain. It's a concept we now call neuroplasticity. The idea is that your brain can, given the right stimulation, reconfigure itself, even in late adulthood. Paul wondered just how far this concept could be pushed. Just how flexible is the adult brain? Can it be trained to work in completely new ways? Many of his fellow neurologists did not believe this was possible. Paul decided that the best way to convince his sceptical colleagues was to build a machine that was able to demonstrate just what he was talking about. Paul was convinced that the blind can be taught to harness the part of the brain that is normally devoted to vision. They can literally learn to see using a completely different sense, touch. The important point here is that the brain is able to use information coming from the skin as if it were coming from the eyes. He designed a chair containing a series of vibrating pins that made contact with the backs of his blind subjects. An image picked up by a camera was then translated into a crude outline by the vibrating pins. Okay, it's a telephone. And the receiver is to the right. Baki Rita was something of a maverick. His supervisor and Nobel Prize winner told him to stop playing around with toys. But Bakirita was convinced that his research would ultimately demonstrate that the brain is far more flexible and far more plastic than people gave it credit for. So he ignored the well-meant advice and carried on his research here at the University of Wisconsin. He died four years ago, just as the prototype of an even more ambitious device was completed. 
This is the thing, is it? Yes, it is. Oh, no, no. It's a Stephen Hawking box, isn't it? And it's called the Brain Port, and the idea is it will help the blind see using their tongues. I'm having a go under the instruction of Paul's protege, Amy Arnoldson. Looking good, looking very styling. The lenses are blackened so I can't see anything. And there's a camera that translates images to a device that goes in my mouth. Right, I'm guessing this is going to go in my tongue. You are correct. There are 400 electrodes. Mm -hmm. So each of those electrodes is going to act like a pixel. If you were to increase the intensity, as you do, you see the oh. pixelation on the tongue. And so any pixel that's white is a strong stimulation. Right. Any pixel that's black is no stimulation. And then with training, people feel the gray stimulation as medium levels of stimulation. I'm going to put something in front of you, and this is just to set the intensity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, can, you can turn the intensity down, or you can take it out of your mouth. Uh. Tell me what you're perceiving. <laughs> oh, God. Mm, that's very, very tickly. I, I am intensely tickly, so I support you. I do, yeah, okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Though it looks bizarre, I'm told you can learn how to use it very fast. I'm going to bring it down. It's going to go to the front of the top. This is what a horizontal line feels mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's in the field of view of the camera. Mm -hmm. You're no longer laughing. Are you becoming accustomed to the <laughs> stimulation? Now that you know what to expect. Mm. Whatever I'm looking at now, I feel a stimulation on the left-hand side, and it's sort of going like that. I don't know what I'm looking at. It's funny you should say, because the contrast that you felt at a diagonal is where my shirt and my skin intersect. Mm. Sorry, I'm just... Like, you'll clean each other. I know, that's... I <laughs> I was trying to describe so that a little bit more del delicately. Right, okay. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Once I immersed myself in the task and really focused, I was surprised by how quickly I made progress. On that side, it's rounded. Yes, very good. Mm. What kind of things have that kind of shape? Spoon. Very good. Why don't you reach out and so touch it? It's um, long and thin one end and sort of more circular at the other end. Mm. Excellent. That was impressive. I wasn't sure you'd actually even get the, the key features, but you did. Mm. What's actually happening is it's like a torch which I'm using to illuminate an object, you know, mm -hmm. and feel round an object, and then I get a general sense of its shape. I'm actually using it pretty much like I would use vision, mm -hmm. but in a funny way. Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. Scanning studies have confirmed that the sensations on the tongue are indeed passing through to the visual cortex, something that wasn't previously thought possible. And you're getting real good at reaching for and, and grabbing the objects. Very good. Oh, but... <laughs> Proof of brain plasticity, that the brain, even in adulthood, can reconfigure itself, is turning the idea that its structure is unchanging on its head. There is a map, but it isn't necessarily fixed. Excellent. The original thought of the brain not being plastic or being very fixed uh, is an old notion now that you also think that maybe the brain has capabilities that we haven't been able to measure just yet. And so it can, it responds to its environment. It changes as a result of the experiences it gets. Which is rather encouraging, isn't it? It sure is. It sure is. <laughs> In the last few decades, we have learned so much that is novel and surprising about the workings of our own brains. And that in no small part is thanks to those individuals with damaged brains who played such a crucial role in the history of psychology. They were operated and experimented on in the name of science and often with little personal gain. Unusual individuals will continue to be prized and probed by psychologists. 
but I do hope that in the future they will also benefit from the insights they help uncover. We owe them so much because it is from them that we have gleaned the knowledge of how our own minds work. They have opened a window into who we really are. Drama still to come here on BBC4 this evening. Stay with us for the final part of our series, Five Daughters, next.